So I'm Coulter Mitchell. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan uh, at the Institute for Social Research, which is, is like the Survey Research Center and the Population Studies Center. Um, I did a postdoc just down the road here at Princeton in a molecular with uh, Sarah McClanahan and uh, Dan Notterman. One's a sociologist, demographer, the other one's a molecular biologist. And I'll talk a little bit about the different data that I work on right now, uh, including the Health and Retirement Study, Fragile Families and Child Well-Being, Army STARS, um, and then some other work uh, that I'm actually working with Sammy. Where's Sammy? Oh, this is good. You point him out and he's not in the room. Um, uh, in, with some psych psychology studies. Uh, and I think the purpose of me being here is uh, really to bring uh, a, maybe a data collection uh, side of things in, into this. So we'll be talking a lot about data analysis, which is really important. But this is where I get this kind of subtitle of, you know, what's past is prologue. The idea being that um, as much as you, uh, want me to turn up the mic? Is that better? I can also bring it over here a little bit more. <coughs> Sli slightly louder? Yeah. Even still? I just don't want to get the reverb going. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to motivate this a little bit. Please interrupt at any point if, you're, if you end up getting curious about something. Um, we can talk more later if, if no one else is interested to. So really, uh, like I said before, I'm going to focus mostly on the, from the collection to raw data which is really what most of what you'll be dealing with for the rest of the, the time here. Why might you be interested in this? Um, I hope one day you might want to actually collect data. Maybe this is not something you want to do um, as a junior person. Out of, just out of curiosity, how many people have actually collected genetic data on a sample size of more than 20? Okay, so we have a, we have a couple handfuls. Okay, so uh, the other thing is, is that the results that you are looking at and you're producing really represent the data. They don't necessarily represent the truth. And that's something that I keep reminding myself of whenever I run this. It's whatever the data are. And sometimes the data aren't exactly what you think they are. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to, to pass along are some of the things you can look for. So, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But then um, first, I'll deal with like who are we actually collecting data from. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Uh, and then. How do we actually collect the data, and how do we generate genetic data, and why might that be important for you to know? And then the final one, which is maybe the most exciting for you in some ways, but I think you probably already know some of these answers, is where do I get genetic data if I don't have any? So uh, I, I also was a graduate student a long time ago at the University of Michigan, and I took a survey methods course, and this is a common thing taught in survey methodology. Um, this is the life of a survey statistic. Um, the idea is that you have this construct of this thing you want to measure, whether it's a survey uh, attitude or maybe it's income, or in our case, someone's gene or epigenetics or something. We have some concept we want to measure and we have a target population. One of the things I would encourage you to think very carefully about is who you really are targeting. Who do you think this represents? If you think it represents the entire world, then you know, keep that in mind. So think carefully, pick a study, keep that in mind, and try to run down through some of these things. And you have both of these scales, and we'll talk both about representation and measurement, and how it ends up eventually in a survey statistic. But along the way, there are different uh, issues that come up. So what's the validity of the construct, how that relates to the measurement, uh, measurement to response. All of these things you guys are probably very used to in a survey methods course, of some, or not a survey methods, just a methodology course, a research methods course. Um, Maybe you talk about this less depending on your field. Uh, I found that when I work with neuroscientists, this is not a concept that they really talk about a lot, which is representation. Um, even with biologists, this is something that isn't covered as much. Uh, but like a sociologist, a demographer, economists tend to think about these things a little bit more. So coverage error, sampling error, those sorts of things. Um, and at each one of these stages, you have to think about who, who we have in the data. Um, and all of that leads to your wonderful genetic results at the end of the day that you're going to certainly get published in a wonderful journal. Okay, so who do we collect it from? 
So this is going to be that part of representation. So again, think of that target population that you have in mind. Who is it that you are studying? Kids, wealthy kids, poor kids. Who is it that you're trying to study? Aging people. Then you have this frame of where you get the data. And that is your covered population. Sometimes you'll have people who are ineligible who are in your study. And sometimes you'll have people who you don't get in your study. OK, so this is kind of one of those classic things. Constantly be thinking about who we're missing. So whose data do we have? One of the interesting things is that uh, if you look at most of these genetic data, uh, especially GWAS data, um, you have kind of these clinical samples. And by that, I mean these are, say, they have some disease, and they're recruited in the hospital. And then they take their DNA versus the, a community sample, which is maybe a neighborhood-based sample, and then population-based. So it's sampled from some specifically designed population. And most of the samples are actually, in the world that you see today, are clinical or community-based. Um, I was actually looking in the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium, and I think it has the highest of all the consortia I've looked at of kind of more population-based studies. Um, and that kind of makes sense. that it's, It has a lot more people who are interested in more, more population-based research in some ways. Other ones have no population-based studies that I can find. Uh, most, some of them are just pure clinical studies. So what, are you, what do you have when you have a clinical study? This really gets at sampling versus recruitment. Um, recruitment's not bad or good. Sampling's not bad or good. They're just different strategies. Um, you know, uh, again, when you see recruitment, it can be literally someone has a disease. We want to do a study of this disease. Will you participate? Um, and then we have to go find some controls who don't have that disease. And how do we recruit those people? And there's not really a set number of there's a set outcome number, but not necessarily a set number of people that they're going to ask first. They're looking for an N that they want at the end. Um, whereas something like the health and retirement study, which is a population-based study, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, they have a set number of people that they're going to ask. And then they try to get everyone to participate. And if they don't get those people, they don't have other people to replace them with. Those were the people that they were trying to get. So what does this look like? Well, there's actually been a lot of work in this in other areas. Um, and we typically don't do a very good job representing the human population in most of our research. So uh, there's this idea of Western educated, industrialized, and rich, rich democratic, or weird samples. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard that acronym before, but the weird samples idea is that this is really who we typically most of our research represents. So in psychology, uh, there was a paper that came out that said 95% of psychological research represents about 12% of the world. So in medical, there's a slightly different way of thinking about this. In medical journals, this, this just came out with less than 5% of US medical studies have any minorities included. OK, so uh, and then based on my own more anecdotal, although I'm trying to put together some people who are looking at this a little more systematically. About 20% of the genetic studies have non-European ancestry, and that gets down to about 3% when you start look when you include uh, Asian ancestry, which there's some uh, like Japanese and Chinese. Once you include those studies in, um, then really you have less than 3%, or from not U.S. or not from European or uh, Asian. Okay. So we may not be m matching who we think we're matching. If you were thinking you were studying something that was the whole world, rein that in a little bit. So why might it matter? Now, this, we could have a long discussion about this, and maybe we can come back to this at the end. It depends on what thing you might care about. There is generalizability, external validity. How, how important are your results to the whole world if really you're only measuring 12% or less? Uh, there are a lot of people who have social justice issues. Uh, that we're really only spending money on one group of people. Um, and then another way, just very pragmatic about the whole thing, is if you're only getting certain types of people, then you have a lot of variables that you may be missing that may be important to the process which you're studying. Right? So these are things you guys have probably thought about before. Maybe you haven't thought about them with genetic data. So uh, one of the things I've done recently is uh, we pulled together some genetic data uh, to look at who does participate in genetic studies when we do try to, 
talk to them. So we have, we're cur currently working with six population-based studies. I'll show results from four. Um, and we're really looking at three different types of covariates. One is kind of broad demographics, then health, and then kind of survey or interviewer effects. Um, and I won't spend a ton of time on this. I'm happy to talk about it more later on. And again, the idea is that we understand who is participating and who's not. So the, the population-based studies we're looking at are the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study, and I'll talk about m these in a little bit more. The Health and Retirement Study, and I actually sent a, that was one on the reading list, is the paper that talks specifically about responding to physical markers and uh, other biological markers in the Health and Retirement Study. The Armor, Army Stars New Soldier Study and the Army Stars Pre- and Post-Deployment Study, and then we're also working with Wisconsin Longitudinal Study and Ad Health to try to get similar data. So just describe this briefly, in part because if you have any questions about these data going forward tonight or tomorrow, feel free to ask me about that. So the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study is a population-based sample of about 5,000 births. Um, and in 20 different cities, uh, and these are larger cities, 200,000 or more, 75 different hospitals. And it was oversampled for non-marital births. But again, it's population-based. Um, and I'm only going to talk about the mothers, although we get DNA from both the mothers and the children. The reason why it's only on the mothers is the children really didn't participate as, in the same way that the mothers did. Health and retirement study, when we, uh, I'm assuming many of you know what this study is. This is the largest and most comprehensive national representative uh, study of Americans over 50. Um, in 2006, they started collecting data, uh, saliva in particular, for genotyping. And it's been done every two years. Um, they currently have 19,000 people with DNA. Okay, so uh, pre and post deployment. This is the Army Stars pre and post deployment study. Uh, this again, uh, this is three brigade combat teams that were collected DNA pre deployment and then immediately post deployment. They drew blood. And this was completed, unlike fragile families and health and retirement study, which was completed in the home, this was completed as they came in in these big groups and they would sit down and draw blood at the same time. Um, so it's a slightly different way of collecting it, and they're also drawing blood. The new soldier study is almost 40,000 uh, soldiers collected blood in their second day of boot camp. So they draw blood for the Army, and then they would say, hey, you're willing to contribute one more vial for us. Uh, so slightly different mechanism. So. At each point, they're still allowed to say no, even the Army studies. That's the, one I, that's the question I get the most. Are they allowed to say no in the Army? And yes, this is a research study, so they can say no. So here's what got me interested in this and the whole, the whole reason is that when looking across fragile families, health and retirement study, pre- and post-deployment study, new soldier study, even Wisconsin longitudinal study, which I didn't mention, which was a male survey, or male, uh, they mailed the tube, the people spit into the tube, and mail it back, and add health, which is also face-to-face. -face. Look at the response rates. They're so shockingly similar. Different way, different methods, different people, different types of people. And we had pretty similar, 80 to 85 percent, 80 to 84 percent, depending on the wave, 86 percent for the pre- and post-deployment. The point is, is it was surprisingly similar. Um, one of the things to know is that when we first started the Fragile Family Study, for example, we were told by many people to expect about 30% response rates. Um, and we thought we should get more than that, but that's what they said all the medical literature had suggested to that point. So, so why is it? Why are they so similar when you wouldn't? Uh, is one question. The question I'm going to show you more a little bit more now is what are the characteristics of the people who agree to participate? And the contrast to that is who aren't we getting the saliva from? So, uh, if there is a green plus sign, then that means that there's a positive relationship between that variable and uh, participating. And if it's uh, and the significant, if it's a, neg a negative red, a, neg a red negative sign, that means it's a negative association. If there's nothing there, there's no association. So generally, we can say uh, uh, that education, for example, across all of these studies, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to participate. Uh, and provide some, some biological data. Married, you're, you're more likely to. Uh, the new soldier study, there weren't very many married people, so that didn't really work very well. And women are more likely to provide DNA. 
Um, and then within race, it's kind of, a, kind of a little more challenging to look at. Compared to whites, Hispanics seem to be slightly more likely in all of these studies. Uh, and African American or black tend to be uh, less likely to participate. Um, these aren't s really gigantic differences, but enough that it's, it's, it's like a 10% range from Hispanic to African American with whites being in the middle for most of these studies. So now think about that target population again and think about who is not participating, who's not providing saliva, and now who are you representing? Okay, next step. Uh, so some health characteristics. This is kind of uh, another, this ties in with the paper that you, you read. Um, really the big finding is this, if you visited a doctor in the last year, you're far more willing to participate. Uh, I thought for sure that that would be true for the Army because they're drawing blood and maybe that they feel more comfortable with that, but it was true for saliva as well, um, providing saliva. A little bit with diabetes, but um, that's pretty much, that's it. Uh, some interesting results there. And maybe one of the things that's also interesting is to realize that the person who asks the questions um, also can contribute to whether or not the person participates. So again, these are interviewers. It doesn't work for the Army studies because those were done in big groups, so it's a slightly different s scenario. But for fragile families, health and retirement study, uh, you know, we see things like the age of the interviewer. If the, if the interviewer is male, they tend to get more people to participate. If they have a higher education, even controlling for the individual's characteristics. Um, and then this, uh, that's positively associated. And then this isn't too surprising. If they were very compliant in other studies that we've, other components that we've done, say more difficult cognitive tasks, or if they, you know, just generally are more compliant in, in their behavior, they're more compliant, they're more likely to give saliva as well, or give biological data. Okay, so again, come back to that target population. Who are you getting and, and, and what are you, uh, who are you missing? And the, the answer to that is we probably are missing certain minorities, uh, and we are certainly missing lower levels of education, lower levels of income, which I didn't show. Um, so not unlike survey data, but we're missing it with biological data. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there's a bit of an ethical dilemma if you get better survey responses when you don't use minority um, uh, interviewers, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to discriminate. How you use. Right, and so typically we actually match on interviewer race. Uh, and uh, but you get negative results there. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, and the thing that's really more difficult is sometimes we get, if we have other things that we're trying to get, like more difficult cognitive tasks or more difficult uh, attitudes, then that relationship might be another direction. So, so a survey person has to try to weigh, you know, which one do they want more, uh, if this relationship is true across all studies, which it may not be. We only had a handful, yeah. Did you look at any interaction in the black population to see if same race reversed some of that negative? There is, there is some, uh, so having, having a same race interviewer does help, but really only for the African American population, yeah. Okay, so even more briefly than that, I, w I wanted to just say that the other thing that you can have is whether or not they give data is fine, but maybe the data that they give isn't the best. So within survey research, we know that the people who, who are at the very end, the people you're struggling to get those last few remaining questionnaires from, usually give the worst data. Um, and that seems to also be true for DNA, um, which is new, and I don't think, this is kind of a newer thing that um, I haven't, this is one of those things that I'll tell you and hopefully you'll see it published shortly. Um, so we look at things like volume uh, for saliva and DNA concentration. Um, and this is a little older, but you know, you do need some DNA to do different things. You need more DNA to say do methylation than you do to do a SNP. Um, so uh, it's not easy for everyone to spit. Um, it's not easy for some people to tell if things are, if they've given enough or not. Um, and DNA concentration can be for a lot of different things, including biological differences, but also how closely they follow the protocol. So if you've ever tried to collect this from people, they often say like, oh, let me rinse my mouth out first so that I can you know, give you the best, cleanest DNA, but then they've now wiped out all of their DNA and we have to wait for another half an hour for it to repopulate. So, 
So it's those sorts of things that are trying to be nice, but then it winds up hurting, out, hurting us. So uh, how can DNA quali quality influence things? Well, it does seem to be related to call rates and failures, especially in more like epigenetic studies and things like that that are, require more, more data but, um, or more sample. But so this is to know who, who's giving stuff and who's not. So DNA concentration does happen to be related to volume. So uh, the more volume you give, interestingly, uh, the, more, the higher the volume that someone would give, uh, the higher the, con the DNA concentration, which I thought it would have been the opposite, but that's not, that hasn't been true for saliva in the studies that we looked at. So the nice thing is, in general, there aren't a lot of findings for individual level variables in terms of uh, being related to DNA volume. There's a little bit with age, so the older you are, you give a little bit less. That's certainly true in the health and retirement study, um, just because it's harder for them to spit. Oddly enough, education, the higher your education, the less volume you give. Uh, I don't have a good explanation for that. Um, there is differences by race in terms of concentration, uh, and that might be uh, biological differences for, for all we know. Um, haven't explored that as much. Um, health, there's really nothing there. So this is good. If it's random, I'm happy, right? Here's where it wasn't good, is we learned very quickly that the biggest effect for DNA quality is the interviewer. Interviewers play a big role. Uh, and I won't get into all of the differences of, of how this means, only to say that about, um, and when you look at DNA quality, about 6% of the, of the uh, variation in volume, for example, is due to uh, individual characteristics. 16 is due to the, the measured interviewer characteristics. And if we have kind of an interviewer fixed effect, it explains about 25% of the variation, which is a lot in DNA quality, and a little scary, to be honest. Uh, that's for adults. For kids, it's even higher. It's about 50% for the interviewer fixed effects. So, yeah. I was wondering, what are the instructions that people get when they spit DNA? If, if they are aware, if they would be aware that more spit means better DNA, they might be willing to spit more. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this is what's so important about, you know, if having well-trained interviewers who, you know, keep on, ta on, on the protocol. And this is where we get people who we say, well, you need to follow this protocol very carefully. And then you have someone who says, well, I think I'll be helpful. And this is exactly what happened. I'll be helpful and have them rinse their mouth out before. Mm -hmm. you know, and then that, that makes it so that there isn't really much DNA uh, when we collect it. We've actually had to do that before where we send the interviewer back and say, you need to go back and get this again because we have no DNA in this tube. Like It's just straight saliva, no DNA is in there. Um, we're very limited. Uh, and so, or it's just mostly water. Um, and, and so, so yeah, it does say that, the nice thing is, is this means that this can be fixed by explaining like you, as an interviewer, have a very important role to play. And if you stray from this, you can really affect our results much more than you realize. I think that that's what that means. It's nice that it's not as much, in, the DNA quality isn't as much an issue of individual characteristics, but yeah. Yes? Okay, so a very, so how do you differentiate uh, between the DNA of the person and say the bacteria that the person might have? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's a good question and we do get that. Um, there's a lot of DNA. In fact, most of the DNA in our bodies comes from, not from us, um, comes from bacteria. Uh, and the nice thing is, is the molecular biologists have a pretty good protocol for how they separate that out. Um, and this is just looking at the human DNA. Um, I, that is not the thing that I do. Um, I have done it when having the molecular biologist look over my shoulder, but, uh, but they do have protocols for that that should get rid of that. And they also have protocols to save the bacterial DNA and get rid of the human DNA in case, you're, in case you want to do that microbiome work. So um, I think I've kind of covered all of this in general. Standard demographic variables do predict non-response and data quality, um, and interviewers can really do a lot. But the thing that's really important to know about all of these studies that I just talked about, they are population-based, but these were all studies that were started kind of in the middle of the recruitment process. We've already been talking to most of these families for you know, several years. Health and Retirement Study has a new cohort that they're now collecting data on, so we can kind of look at this a little bit more closely with a new cohort. 
but still, there's issues of um, uh, the fact that these are already pretty committed groups, so maybe it's even worse than I'm letting on. Um, and then, of course, a lot more, you guys saw me talking a little bit about interviewer effects, but um, the nice thing is I think those are tractable. We can fix those. Um, I think for the, well, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about this. One, one way that a lot of people handle in the survey methods world, the way they handle things like non-response, is you can use weights to adjust for this. Now this is, as far as I know, and, and someone, if you know differently, I haven't seen weights used in a genetic study, like a GWAS study. Dan, have you seen anyone use weights? No. Okay. So in survey research, we use this all the time, right, to account for non-response and, and to make it population representative. We don't do this in genetic work. Um, so could we do that? Uh, well, what we did is we used, we're doing this now in the health and retirement study, but we used the new soldier study and the pre and post deployment study uh, and said, like, what would our results look like if we run it with and without weights, um, accounting for non-response and to make it look more like the army that we would expect to see. Um, and to be clear, weights are, are generally just a handful of variables used to kind of make that sample look like the population it's supposed to, that target population that we're interested in. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, uh, and you get a slightly more than just controlling for the covariates. So a lot of times we think if we just control for the covariates, that that's, a, that's sufficiently, and it gets us most of the way there, but not all the way. And a good sampling statistician could come in and really give you all of the reasons why you should always use weights. Um, so you guys are going to have a wonderful lecture on how to do GWAS. This is not that lecture. Let me just generally say very briefly, if you don't know what kind of a GWAS looks like, and forgive me when you see how it's actually done and how basic this is. Okay, so imagine you have a simple OLS or logistic regression, essentially done millions of times, right, for all your different SNPs. Um, and then you find some sort of, uh, you, you pick a p-value cutoff at some point, um, and you say these are the ones that look like we've, we've achieved some ge genome-wide significant effect, and then you start going into like, is there, are there other hits that are close to that? Are they correlated in any ways? We typically don't do these in one study. Um, we, we typically do it by meta-analyzing many studies, and actually uh, we have people here who run a consortia that, that do exactly that. Um, one of the largest ones, I think. Uh, is that right, Dan? It's got to be one of the largest by far. So they, they really know what they're doing, um, and it, but it takes a lot of meta-analyzing hundreds of studies to pull this off. So and then we typically go to a replication sample, which is often a smaller n, um, but still quite large. Um, and still sometimes uses a meta-analysis to do that. So uh, as far as I know, at no point is sample design accounted for. And these studies may be very different in the way they've been sampled. In fact, many of them are going to be totally different types of samples because some of them are clinical, some of them are community, some of them are population-based. How do those differ? Is it important to consider those differences? So we look at sampling weights in a GWAS. Uh, and uh, I'll show you a little bit about that. Again, this is pre, pre and post deployment study and then um, kind of two different of the new soldier studies and then health and retirement study. Um, and then we use a sampling weight and then a selection of case and controls. So the problem is, is current GWAS software does not actually have a, an ability to account for sampling weights. So you can try to control for them, but that doesn't quite get all of the way there. So we had to run this very slowly in a survey methods, kind of a survey like a Stata or R. We tried it in a few different ones, and it's just very, very slow. It's not built to be able to handle that kind of GWAS analysis. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time going over each of these phenotypes. I'll show you on suicide attempt, because that's really what the Army's data was designed for. So that's what our, our GWAS, is, GWAS is, is on suicide attempt, but we've also done it in PTSD and social anxiety and cognitive ability and BMIs and process. Um, and then we'll show you, I'll show you some unconditional and on weights as well as uh, conditional on weights and then accounting for the sampling weights. Yeah. And what are the weights you calculate? And what are the Yeah, so I, I, oh, I guess I took those slides out. So, um, 
So they transform it by making, so we have a sample and we know what our population is supposed to look like. So if we think about the army, for example, and we say, okay, uh, we know what the whole army is supposed to look like and we know that our sample, it gets close, but because of those things I showed you before of non-response and data quality, um, our sample doesn't look exactly like them. So we adjust people to be, uh, so, so that the sample, when we produce our results, it looks like it comes from the population. In other words, if, you know, if we have fewer people from lower education, the people with lower education have a higher weight so that they're, they're worth more to the study, so to speak. Um, so we did have a, a nice hit on chromosome six uh, for suicide attempt. Uh, and so that's kind of the starting value of our, of our GWAS. Um, even though it was quite small, we only had 20,000 people, uh, it's the largest suicide attempt GWAS to this point. Um, and like I said, that's what the purpose of that study was. Um, and again, we had that nice cluster. Uh, like I said, if you zoom in, you see uh, all of these uh, hits that are highly correlated. And again, you'll learn more about this, how to recognize these. Um, if you don't know what this is, this is the chromosome on the bottom. It's like the DNA is laid out as a long line. So you have chromosome 1 through 21, 22. And then these are p-values uh, on the, on the y-axis. So the higher it is up on that, the smaller the p-value. And that's like 5 times 10 to the negative 8 or 5 times 10 to the negative whatever. Um, and that's what that red line is. So everything above that is highly significant. So if you use it as a covariate, it looks pretty much the same. Jumping to kind of the big conclusions on this is that uh, when we look at even just those, yeah, go ahead. For oh, for the effect size for the GWAS. Um, oh, you're gonna ask me. Let's see if I can think about what this is. Uh, I think for our top one was uh, forty, like uh, one point four five, uh, one point six. I think something somewhere in that range. So it depends. That our top hit was was actually not a SNP. It was like a uh, deletion. But then uh, our top SNP I think was one one point. Four or five was the odds ratio, I think. Yeah, so it, yeah, a 45% increase. Well, it, so let me take that, let me take one step back on that. Um, I guess that wasn't just for our top SNP. That's when we were looking at the cluster of that whole group of on that, that one gene. Um, so it was actually more than just that one. I, I don't really remember. I can get back to you on exactly what the top one was. I'll get back to you on that one. But, uh, but that whole gene, if we, look, if we look at like several SNPs combined, because uh, we, we have several independent. We can, I don't know if you can see that. But yeah, we do have some independent signals in that same gene. And so that does increase suicide attempt. The interesting thing is it didn't actually increase uh, First of all, remember that suicide attempt is very rare, so it doesn't take much to get a big increase. Uh, that's part of it, and that's why it's so difficult to study it. Um, but then, uh, I can't remember where I was going with that. But, uh, yeah. Have you ever big GWAS that you just published on suggestive well-being yeah. or depression? It would be interesting to see if you, if you both replicate. Yeah. No, so it would be interesting. To, so we're, we're currently uh, replicating these in the PGC. Uh, and so we found that in that, that same, uh, the same region, we find a, a significant effect. One of the things that's interesting is that this, these same SNPs don't replicate in, uh, in different racial groups and different ethnicities, but, um, but the same region does. But, so it's not the same SNP, but the same uh, gene region does. But yeah, I don't want to go too, too far down this. I'm happy to talk more about it, but, but also I, my focus was more on accounting for the weights, but go ahead. Uh, this is not weights, I was just curious yeah. if that locus is like known for anything. Or anything. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's near the MRAP gene, uh, which, uh, yeah, I didn't put any of those kind of that kind of information on there, but that, 
has been, that's related to some brain chemistry and uh, proteins in, in brain uh, function. And then, and has been related to, uh, I think it's anxiety as well, but weakly and not in a GWAS. But uh, yeah, we can talk more about this. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting things about this that make it both exciting and also very frustrating because it is a small sample uh, and there aren't very many other suicide attempt studies to kind of join in on. So uh, anyway, so one of the things I was going to point out is that, um, you know, so our odds ratios don't really change that much by accounting for it as a covariate. And in reality, in reality, uh, the p-values don't change very much either. Um, so controlling for the, for the weight didn't really do anything. In other words, you can't just control for it in a GWAS uh, like uh, plink or something like that and, and have it work. Yeah? So just, I just want to make sure I understand what, what, you, what you did here. So, so the weight then would be sort of inversely yep. proportional to how representative that person is. Right, right. Inverse sampling weight, yep. And so, and so you, can you just toss that in as... as right, so, so the idea, for some people they say, well, if you could just control for that, you should be fine. It, Why? It doesn't. That's the point. So, so, so it's a straw man in some ways because what it is is people say, well, we can just control for it, it'll be okay, and we can put it into Plink and it'll be fine. And my point is to say, actually, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't really. Doesn't really do anything. Um, so that's the, part of this is is this is a direct. If if you have a population-based study, you probably have weights, and if you could, you might as well try to use them in your analysis. But you can't because you know, like Plink isn't designed to handle sampling weights. So how do you do that? And so one way said, so, so, well, we can just control for it. Well, you can't. You, that, won't, that won't do it. But um, if you do use it, like in a, in a regular package like R, State, or SAS have these survey uh, sampling uh, packages, um, there you start to see more of an effect of, of the weights. And it works. I mean, generally it works a little better. You get stronger effects. Uh, you get smaller p-values, but n not so much so, to be honest, that I would say like this is what every study must do to to fix this issue. Does that make sense? So this was more of an experiment to if you have sampling weights, will it actually help you? And it might a little bit, but it it doesn't seem to make the big difference that you might hope it would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and so and you think that maybe there's there's some group that is underrepresented in your sample. Yeah. But yeah, and so and so, so the only reason you'd expect the effect to increase is if you think that a group yeah that has a larger effect than right. Right, and so so it could it could go either way. It could go either way. It could it could go either way, and, and there's and so that's one of the reasons why you don't you would never put in a sampling weight because you want your results to look better. You would put them in because it's the right thing to do. Does that make sense? And I and and so for this for for suicide attempt, it goes one direction. It could go a totally different direction for something else. For exactly the reason that you just said. Let's just say that people with lower education that the genetic effect is much stronger for them for for a suicide attempt, but it's much weaker for them in another one. And then by putting in the survey weights, you give them a higher weight in the regression, then, yeah, then that's what that would happen. I mean, on, on the other hand, it also kind of it depends on why you think you're not represent, right? right? If, if they're underrepresented because of selection, doing sampling weights isn't going to help, right? You have to think that they're sort of random. I mean, the reason that, the, the reason that you're not represented in the first place is just some random process, right? Well, so if, yeah, if it, it could be due to a random process, it could be, and it could be due to to variables that are maybe correlated with education that you don't have measured, right? Oh, so we got we got one over here too. Yeah, go ahead. On the left. Um, yes. So my question relates to to Patrick. So okay. Um, weights 
carry assumptions of, of their, their own, like for one thing you, 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 you assume you really know or you know well what is the distribution mm -hmm. uh, throughout the population. So to what extent is it worth like to add those assumptions to your model, um, you know, in terms, because in one, in one way I think um, weights give the researcher more confidence to say, oh, you know, my results are really generalizable when then they actually might not be precisely because of what Patrick yep. pointed out. No, so here's what I will say. I totally agree with what you're saying. I completely agree that weights add another assumption, but you are already making that assumption by running the regression and reporting it as truth or reporting it as like this represents what that you don't know. So I'm making explicit the assumptions that by putting in a weight and, and that's not necessarily right or wrong, right? I mean, I don't necessarily disagree that you should, I don't use weights on, all the time on the things that I do. My point is, is that we are all making these assumptions and we need to be aware of it. And by putting in a weight, you're making it very explicit what you think you have to do to make your sample look more generalizable. But you are absolutely correct that there may be other processes going on. You may be correct that it is something um, that, you know, that we're not measuring. It may not even be important. Like the variables that we are waiting for may not be important to the thing that we're studying. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, if you ask uh, a good sampling statistician, they will say it's really sad. You know, we, we're using variables that explain you know, maybe 10 or 12% of the variance at most on most of our phenotypes and saying like, yep, these are the variables that make it so that you're totally generalizable. So we're clearly missing some things. But I think my point is more to say, um, we're already missing those. We're just not acknowledging it. Is that fair? Um, and trying to take a step towards how do we make it more generalizable? Maybe survey weights are not the thing to do. Maybe it's better sampling, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's not using clinical samples. Maybe it's using only clinical samples, but it's not a discussion we're having. And, and to be aware of that component. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, to add to the conversation, Ken Bolin and a few other people just published in, in our review of statistics, mm. um, a paper called Are Weights Needed? A review of all the diagnostic yeah. tests. So I mean, it, it goes into a really good discussion about when and how and how to determine if yeah. um, you need to use weights. No, it's a great discussion. It's just not one that we've had in this literature. And if you're working in, like, say, the health and retirement study is a great example. If you aren't going to do a GWAS, let's just say you're just going to go in and you want to look at APOE and the effect on some outcome, and that's all you really care about, or a genetic risk score, which you'll learn about. So you're going to do that. Well, do you use weights or not? Why don't you use weights? Should you be using weights? What, who are you trying to generalize to? Those are all the sorts of questions that, in some ways, I'm hoping to have you think about when you're doing your work. So uh, I won't go into too much more about this, but you know, we did see some, pretty, some moderate changes, 10% by about 10% within the study. And then there are some gains even when you take those results and try to replicate it in a smaller sample. Um, and it looks like it's similar for PTSD and social anxiety. So there are some changes which actually you wouldn't be too surprised if those variables that you care about are somehow moderating uh, the, the effect of the gene to the uh, phenotype. Um, I'm not gonna go, uh, you, you will have a population stratification discussion and that is a really important one to pay very close attention to because it's, it's a big deal. I will also point out that it is one of many potential stratifiers of our data. Um, Ancestry is a very clear one. Um, so population weights do not resolve this issue. Uh, and it's something just to be aware of if, you know, if I led you to believe that these are solving all the problems, it won't, won't solve this one. Um, but still, uh, it, it's something to keep in mind. Um, let's see, uh, yeah. So, uh, so one of the things is with population stratification, which is the, different, the fact that ancestry groups have different allele frequencies and that can kind of lead to a false sense of a relationship if you don't account for the fact that different ancestries have different allele frequencies. Um, 
And often these big population-based studies like fragile families, which is 50% African ancestry, 30% Hispanic ancestry, and 20% uh, European ancestry. Well, if you only want European samples, then you just took our sample from 5,000 to you know, 20% of that. So uh, it, it can also often be a challenge because of that. And often the results, at least in a lot of the work that I've seen, often the results in one ethnicity, like one SNP, do not replicate in other ethnicities. Um, that seems to be less true when you look at, say, a, a gene test or uh, even a genetic risk score. Those seem to work a little bit better, which makes sense, but a specific SNP uh, often doesn't. And, and I've seen very limited work on this. Um, if you run like a GWAS on one gender, it seems to also be true that it doesn't, you know, that it, it often doesn't work. I can't say often. In the few times I've seen it, the SNPs that show up for men are not the same SNPs that show up for women. And the thing that's interesting about that is that men and women, except for the X and Y chromosome, don't differ in their allele frequencies. They shouldn't, at least, unless there's a mortality selection. So in other words, I think there's a lot more that can be done with this to make our data better. Maybe sampling statisticians could be brought in. But as you guys get into this world, um, be aware that if you're especially social scientists, this is not something that's usually talked about as much. Just be aware of that. Um, so we've kind of already t talked about this. How do, what does it mean that we're combining all these studies? Who are we representing? Um, and there really aren't weights for most of these studies, even if you wanted to. So it's really a population-based studies that have the weights, not a clinical sample, at least not that I've seen. Um, let alone the fact that it, there's a different recruitment often for cases as for controls. Um, and then, yeah, how do we contend with cluster designs? That's something for us to think about if you guys want to talk about it more later on. Um, so let me, let me get turned a little bit to how do we collect these data. Um, and we saw a few people who raised their hand on how do we collect. So this is more about that measurement side of things. Um, and as you know, that in recently there has this big, been this big rise in molecular data. Um, so we were just talking about twin studies. And so now we're talking about collecting molecular data. Uh, and part of this has been this ease of collection of saliva and blood. It's really improved. Probably the biggest thing is the cost reduction from even just a few years ago. I remember it being well over $1,000 uh, to get a GWAS kind of equivalent or a million markers, and now it's less than $100, uh, much less actually, if you have a big group of people buying it. And I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but there are plenty of studies that have that say, we will not continue to fund your study unless you collect biological data. NIH has said that to several different studies. Like, we won't, we're not going to, you need to have these data. We don't know what you're going to do with them, but you need to collect them. I've actually heard that exact quote. So uh, clearly, there have been a lot of publications as of late. These are, uh, you know, this is total number of publications on the y-axis and on the x-axis. It's the year. Um, this is a nature review. And so you can see these are uh, GWAS publications. Um, really nothing prior to 2005, and now you're looking at thousands of uh, genetic studies or GWAS-related studies, so every year. So it's, it's a lot. Big, big change. This is, what you're, this is what you're stepping into. This is how fast it changes, too. Also, uh, the cost has gone down, like I said before. That uh, Moore's law is how fast you expect like, technology to improve and the cost of technology to decline. That green line that drops way off of Moore's law much more rapidly than you would expect is the cost of sequencing per genome, uh, which is now around 1,000 for sequencing, supposedly, although I think it's actually even cheaper than that now. OK, so how many of you have collected data again? Collected? How many of you have ever just collected one sample of DNA? Just my own count. Your own counts. <laughs> Your own counts. OK, good. So 23 and me. <laughs> yeah, OK. Or, or Ancestry, too. They, they do it. OK, so one of the nice things is that uh, in some fields, tissue matters a lot, right? Within genetics, typically, it doesn't. Uh, DNA is pretty much the same. Um, 
The one exception to this is if you have a tumor, sometimes they will biopsy that tumor to see if there was a genetic change in that. That's probably not what you guys are doing. I'm assuming not. So it doesn't really matter. Epigenetics, it does matter. Um, we'll hear more about epigenetics tomorrow. Um, and that can be quite different um, depending on the cell type and tissue type. Uh, the most common ones, I think you guys know this, are saliva and blood. Uh, blood, very common in, in clinical studies. Saliva and more of these population-based studies in part because it's so easy to collect. Um, I forgot to bring all of my show and tell. Um, I have all of these sitting in my office to show people. These are different ways of collecting saliva. Uh, the Origin 250, or 500, Origin 250, and it said that I know those numbers. That's the pediatric collection kit, kit with the swabs, and this is an RNA kit. Uh, so gene expression kit. This happens to be HRS is now collecting blood uh, in the field and this is what their protocol is, all the tubes that they're collecting to do different things, um, including they have a little, every interviewer has a centrifuge that they then spin out and they get the serum and send those off for different assays um, and flow cytometry, um, even RNA that they have stabilized. Some of them are shipped on ice, some of them are not. Um, it's a quite a, a complicated thing if you can imagine going into an interview, into a home and collecting all these tubes and then shipping them. You can see why they often collect saliva. But you can collect blood in the field, um, but it takes a lot of uh, coordination. So 50 milliliters, by the way, if, I don't know if you saw it. That's how many, that's how much they're collecting. So the big thing is time. Time is important in this, and this is the thing to remember. And the reason why I bring this up, by the way, is again to go back to, you may want to collect it at some point. I get that. So you pay attention. At the same time, if you're studying epigenetics and you don't know where your cells came from or you don't know where your data came from, then you may not know what your results mean. And so I, the other paper I had you read, and I'm trying to forget, I'm trying to remember who it is, uh, which study I sent, but it was just really well documented. And that's what I wanted you to see, a study that has really well documented how they collected their samples how they stored them, how long they had them out in the field. All of those things matter, less for DNA, to be honest, than it does for epigenetics or something like that. Saliva does seem to be more stable than blood. Um, we can go into that in more detail at some point. Uh, and really, this, the thing is, is the faster you can get it into a minus 80 freezer, the better. The longer it's sitting out, even saliva, uh, the worse things tend to be, even for DNA. Um, uh, DNA quality does decline. So those origin tubes, um, you know, they claim that they can stay for seven years without having any degradation. Um, but that was based on seven samples. Um, and there is some, uh, you know, some loss of quality of DNA. But it can stay for a while. And in a minus 80, it can stay, it seems like, pretty much forever. Um, there are different preservatives in those caps. Uh, and that's what keeps it from degrading. It's not just a straight saliva sample, if you were wondering. Um, and like I said, DNA can stable stable for years, but it still degrades. Epigenetics, telomere length, can de can, uh, which is the ends of the chromosomes. Um, people measure that to kind of measure stress and aging and um, biological age. And those can rapidly deplete if sitting on a lab table um, in blood without any preservatives. So just as an example, uh, again, I won't, won't dwell too much on this, but this is three different samples that were left out for different periods of time, for length of time, uh, and, uh, and then measured, like their, this is their telomere length, so the length of the, the end of the chromosome. And in general, these should all be the same. They should be a flat line. But as you can see, as time goes along on the x-axis, you can see that especially for the really long telomere length that's already noisy for each, for each measure that, uh, for each batch that it was run on, you can see that over time there's this decline because it's, it's actually degrading over, over a period. Those are days. Um, so we're actually doing different experiments right now looking to see how epigenetics change, how long they stay out uh, versus how long telomeres stay out, and even DNA. Uh, I don't think the DNA is going to be a problem, but these other things might be. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much. This is kind of early work done by genotyping. Now we genotype more automatically. Uh, these are different ways that uh, you use uh, to do like a chip, a GWAS chip. Still, still pretty intensive, but more, a lot more automated. So 
The general I idea, I, please, this one is a lot more complicated. I'm happy to talk about the whole process, but probably not now. Um, but this is, you can see it's pretty intensive to take a DNA sample, put it on a chip, label it, uh, put it into a probe, array, hybridization, and then put it into the wash, and then scan it and you come up with, with your, um, your intensities. And let me just show you what that looks like. So, have any of you seen one of these before? Okay, so this is different. Remember, when we do these GWASs, we're not actually measuring the length of any DNA anymore. That's not what we're doing. We're doing a light intensity. So you have the intensity of for one signal and the intensity for the other, and then we determine what genotype you are. Now, if you look at the one on the left, those are three pretty clear signals, right? So you have like your AA person who's the red, you have your BB person, which are the purple, and the green are the ABs. Pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, that's rare. It's, it's more like the one over here where you have some people who are clear and other people who are mixed, so you can't really determine. And that's why you get call rates that are like much lower. If you have some where you can't split these people into any groups, then you end up not having that SNP. So that's where you end up getting these millions of markers like that. Yeah? If I have uh, questions uh, about these sorts of plots with epigenetics, should I save that for tomorrow? Um, I don't know. Well, that, I don't know if that'll be covered in it tomorrow. I'm happy to talk about it later today, but um, I don't know if that they're going to cover it tomorrow. Great. Sure. Um, so with epigenetics, uh, you're sampling a bunch of different cells. Yeah. And you're taking an average of epigenetics yeah. across cells. Not across all the cells. Yep. Um, so you'd, you'd be getting so your your light signal, I imagine, would be an average between these yes. different things. Yeah. Um, you could get something that's like a continuous variable, maybe maybe multimodal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can we it, should we interpret it the epigenetic data as, as truly a continuous variable, or or should we uh, interpret it as a discrete variable that measure error makes look? That's continuous. a good question. That's a that's a deep that's a deep concept. Uh, you know. I mean, the interesting thing is if it's tied to a SNP, you can very clearly see, for example, that you have like zero methylation, 100% methylation, and 50 with some measurement error. So you're, it, you're very right that it, it is more discrete with some measurement error that makes it look continuous. But in theory, uh, it could be continuous as it's, as it's measured on the spectrum. But I, I get your point that there's, you know, it's really more of an interval measure with some measurement error. But... Um, but yeah, it, it could be continuous. Yeah. yeah. And no one would object if I treated it as no. continuous? No, 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 no. No, they treat it as continuous almost all the time. Great. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So, in, in these cases where the SNPs are dropped, how well does imputation provide the correct information? So, that, that depends on a lot of things. Uh, it depends on how well you've genotyped the other SNPs around it. And it depends on how strong your imputation algorithm is. And so the general feeling that I've got from many different researchers is that imputation is nearly perfect, right? That we want for to some groups, SNPs. for some groups, not for all groups, but yeah, okay. we'll talk about that. But yeah, okay. yeah. So we will talk about that. Well, I, mean, I don't know about the imputation part. I can tell you. So one of the things I was going to get to was um, I was going to talk. Well, I'll get to that. I'll I'll okay. get a little bit to that. I, I thought there was another hand. Yes, go ahead. So I can imagine that for some studies it would be, so you talked a little bit about the type of tissue that you get, and I can imagine yep. that for some studies, um, especially evolutionary studies, gain, uh, analyzing gains would be more important. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something that happens at all, or is it like hard to get those kind of cells? Oh, those? Uh, well, I, I actually was just at an epigenetics conference that that's what they were studying, except it was, was mice. <laughs> Uh, not humans. I did see one study with humans, so that's, it's rare. Okay. But, uh, but yes, there are people who, who study that. But most of it's blood or saliva. Um, there are some biopsy things as well. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what one of these SNPs lo or one of these chips looks like, so this is the psych array. I use this in fragile families and in army stars. It's one of the smaller ones, also one of the cheaper ones. Uh, it has two, two, 277,000 Exome SNPs, so these are the coding regions. Um, 5,000 custom psych 
uh, chip or snips. In other words, like these come from the literature and the person who created this, the, the list said, these are the ones that we care about the most. Make sure these are on there. Uh, and then 271,000 tag snips. Tag snips uh, are, I think I'll get into this. It's based on this idea that you don't need all of the snips, that one snip right next to the next one is probably highly correlated, for lack of a better word, and strong linkage disequilibrium. And that's what these red triangles are, is that these are kind of highly correlated SNPs. And the idea is that you don't need you know, all of those. You can get a handful of them, and you'll do pretty well kind of imputing to that whole red block area. So that's why we don't get all of them. We get 271,000. However, linkage disequilibrium is different by different gene uh, by different ancestries. And so this is why we have different imputation strategies for different European types. So, and you guys will get into this in a lot more detail. So I won't go into that part. However, uh, so I won't talk too much about this other than to say um, one of the things that's challenging, though, is that not only is, are there these big differences, but the chips were designed primarily on European ancestry populations. And so that's part, and there's good reasons for that. You know, um, one of the biggest reasons is, is that uh, Europeans have like the least genetic diversity in terms of uh, you know, human diversity, in terms of uh, you know, SNPs. So it's, it's much easier. You have much less variation to deal with. Whereas if you go to uh, an African ancestry population, there's a lot more genetic diversity, far more difficult to get uh, to explain the same amount of variance. Um, it certainly can't do it with the same number of SNPs. So it makes it challenging. It's far more challenging to do that. And that's where most of the initial work was done. The thing that I wanted to bring up was two or three years ago, I would have said, and that's the state of the field. We have pretty good sequencing going on in those populations. We don't have great SNPs, SNP chips. But there are several new ones. And just in the last couple of years, and especially the last year, so there's a new African uh, ancestry uh, chip, there's a Hispanic chip, there's a multi-ethnic, and there's even an Asian-specific one. My point is, is we actually are starting to make more progress on this. So if you do study groups that are not just European uh, ancestry, uh, hopefully, I'm hoping that these, these chips are going to measure that diversity in those SNPs better than we have in the past. And hopefully, this means that we'll be able to do more research in those groups. Yeah. Yeah. How does Hispanic play out? Oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> so Hispanic has both, uh, has, has kind of two things going on. One, it has this population structure, you know, where you have different groups. So you have African ancestry, European ancestry, and then Asian, which is Native American ancestry. So you have these three groups. But they also has the combination of admixture, which is those three groups uh, having lived together for centuries and now uh, they have Hispanic population. So it's just, it's, it's a very difficult group to, uh, um, to create a chip that kind of studies all of these. It's much easier to do it within each group, if that makes sense. Um, yeah? Um, how do these chips deal with, with interracial backgrounds? With in, so with interracial backgrounds? So this is, this is exactly what I'm talking, I mean, so, so it's a challenge for, for groups that have, or for people, for any individual, um, they may have part of their genome in some ways measured better. You just may not see all of the diversity because you're getting a set of SNPs that uh, are really, were designed initially at least for one group of, one ancestry group, and you may not capture all the genetic diversity of another group. Yes? Yeah. What usually happens downstream to your effects and what you see in your analysis? Is there a bias or is it just tenured? Well, so this is why most of the, to be honest, this is why most GWASs are of one ancestry group. And that one ancestry group is typically European American. Or not European American, just European ancestry, sorry. Because it's challenging. And then almost all of the results are done within ancestry. And so. That link, I don't think, has been done as well. And so it'll be really interesting to see with these new chips that are better designed 
in theory for different ancestries to see if they if they have better effects because of that. I, I don't know the answer to it, to be honest. Okay, so I'm not going to cover all of this since we just kind of talked through all of this. I am hopeful that the recent chips may improve coverage, but it's a little too early to tell. Okay, in the last couple, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just thinking about how there are different chips and some yeah. than others, and there are reasons to use new chips with new data collection. Um, we've had issues trying to reconcile SNP names. Yeah. Chips. Yeah, do you have oh. recommendations for that? Like, you start using David, like, are there particular sites or resources or packages that you found helpful? That is a very good question. That is one of the most challenging things. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we we'll talk more <laughs> later on because no, because there's a lot there's a lot to be said about that and actually probably the best person in some ways are these people who run the like like Dan who run these large meta analyses because they understand better than anyone else like how t studies can be come from very different ways of genotyping and then somehow are able to bring it together most of the time it's through imputation and then once it's been imputed to like thousand genomes then Typically, those names are the same, and it looks works well. The problem ends up being, what if your chip doesn't map onto 1,000 genomes very easily? And, and usually, there are, for Illumina, it's usually not so bad. Affymetrix isn't so bad. But then there are other ones, and, and I've never used those. I don't know about those, but we could certainly talk about it more. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like that makes it difficult to use a polygenic score that's been estimated from one chip on a, on a different on a bottom line. On, on a different chip? I mean, so I, again, it depends on if you're using, it can be, yes, that, that's true. In fact, uh, we've had that within, even with AHRS, that if, if, if a meta-analysis has been done and they've used it like a different protocol or maybe they've used a different imputation strategy and then they report back the SNPs that were significant but those don't map on to our SNPs, then it can be a real challenge. The best thing to do, to be totally honest, is if everyone would report their uh, position, that would help tremendously to at least verify that we have something similar if it's named a different name. Uh, that's a position is always helpful. <laughs> and but that's not always given, especially in the results. Yeah. Uh, with regards to position, is that even I guess is that just with respect to like one reference genome? Because there are like yeah. mutations that you said and right. Said. right, right. No, so I mean at, it's at least one more piece of information. Um, but you still have to work through this and and we'll lose, like when we've done this within the health and retirement study, picking some other uh, consortia, uh, then uh, yeah, we lose a fair number of our SNPs that we can't find in there, or we can't find their SNPs in our data. That happens. So I only have a couple more slides left, and we're getting close to the end. Um, and I'm still happy to talk about this a lot more. So ways for people to get genetic data. In some ways, this is the most exciting. In other ways, it's... Uh, Maybe the most challenging, um, or not. So, I'm going to I'm going to toss this out as these are like kind of three different ways that you can do this. Um, just real quickly is I think the most common way maybe for people like you, uh, and certainly was for me is to find collaborators with data. Um, that's kind of the easiest way, and you can go to conferences like Integrating Genes and in Social Sciences and uh, come to things like this and talk to your mentor. Um, that's probably the most common way. Other way is accessing public data through dbGaP, ICPSR, things like that, and you can collect your own. I collect data. I collect these uh, part of big studies. Let me just tell you, please think two or three times or four before you decide that that's what you want to do earlier in your career. Um, it is not an easy enterprise, and, um, and it takes a lot more time than I think you think it will. Um, and certainly before you can finish analyzing it. Yeah, Dan. So this is great. So, so I was going to go right to some of those things, which are like HRS. So let me just show you. HRS is an example, and I'll tie them into Army and Fragile Families and some of the other ones I'm doing. So HRS is a public data, data set. Um, it is cleaned and put into dbGaP. Now as, where's Mark? Mark was asking me about this, and I checked on this. So, uh, so you submit things to, a, to, to dbGaP. It doesn't mean that they release it immediately. So um, HRS has version one has been on there for a while and that's like two, the year 2006 and 2008 data. It's like 12,000 people approximately. Their version two is, is there. I don't know if it's actually, it's been released 
by HRS for several months now. I don't know if it's been released on dbGaP. Um, and that's about 15,000 people. You're saying no, it hasn't, or no? So that's been there. It's been in dbGaP, but hasn't been released by dbGaP. And that's not something that, that the studies have control over. Uh, HRS just said in the next month they're going to turn over version 3, which is all the exome data and GWAS data, to dbGaP in the next month, a month and a half, and that's 19,000 people. Now you might ask, if they haven't released version 2, when will they release version 3? I don't know that, and HRS doesn't know that. That's a dbGaP issue. Um, but that's one place to go. <laughs> And I wish I could tell you that that's, you know, but if you have a colleague who already has HRS data, then maybe that's where you go first. Um, or you form a friendship and call the HRS people and see what you can do. Um, I wish, I mean, I, it's, just, it's just the way it goes. Army data, we are preparing to submit that to dbGaP. Um, it's taken a lot longer because it's Army data. Um, and I am happy to say that it looks like that will, it will, that will be released. Once it's released, um, whether or not it's released to, to dbGaP, it means that if you do know people who are, have access to the study, that we're also allowed to share those data more freely. But part of it has been going through the process of getting Army approval to put it, um, to release it as a public data file, which has not been easy. Yeah? Do you know anything about the million vaccine program data set? I just know a little bit. I don't know. What, uh, I don't know what what part about when they're going to release their data or. Uh, well, I mean, my understanding is that you have to apply and then Yeah, that's probably. So typically, if it's funded by NIH, and I think I say this in here, typically, if it's funded by NIH, they ask that you release the data. However, and you'll notice this on here for for HRS, that doesn't mean they have to release the phenotype data. Oh. So. A lot of these studies don't do that for obvious, I mean, there, there's good reasons for doing that. It might seem like, oh, they're trying to hide their data. There's good reasons to do that, right? So some of these data are, are pretty sensitive, um, and they don't want just anyone. That, the thing is, is for HRS is a great example. They will give you the data. You just have to prove that you can have, you have a secure place to analyze it. If you have a program, have a protocol, and you can get the phenotype data very, very quickly in contrast to the genotype data. Um, and then they have a crosswalk between the two. Um, so the really the thing that's going to take a long time is getting dbGaP data and dealing with the computing issues around having that much data, 19,000 people, 2.5 million genotyped variables, and I think 25 million, 24 million imputed variables for each person. That's a lot. So that's their bigger issue than getting access to it. What's yes. the rough size of that? Uh, I thought it was eight terabytes for the 19. 19, I think that's right. I, I could double check that, but I think that's what I remember it being. Um, so yeah, the phenotype data is easy in contrast to dealing with that. Um, but that's why they do it, and a lot of studies will do that. The Army and maybe this Million Veteran project, project might be very similar, where it's like, you can have the genetic data. If you want these phenotype data, you're going to have to go through one more step to prove that you uh, have secure servers that can handle um, the data. or you have to get onto an enclave to do very sensitive data analyses. Yeah. You have one terabyte up there. For, for which one? For, where's the one terabyte? Several versions of the data that are available. Oh, so this is older versions. I was talking about the newest version, sorry. Um, so this is what dbGaP looks like. There are, it looks like 703 as of 2016 studies. So dbGaP has grown, so there are lots of studies on there. Um, and like I said, uh, one of the things that's nice is the Michigan Center for Demography of Aging does have, a, have a, a, a tutorial for social scientists to help how do you download data and how do you pot potentially upload data to dbGaP once it gets out. <laughs> um, just to put a plug in for consortia, um, I think that's actually a great place to start in some ways. If you, if you can at least go to the website and look and see who's, who's doing work that you might be interested in. Um, so they're typically part of at least one of these. Um, and many of these have websites that have links to the potential studies or participants, uh, you know, know the data well enough that that can help you. Um, you know, so if you come to me and ask, what are you going to, you know, what, what do you suggest? I probably have 20 or 30 studies in my head uh, that I could help you direct, and I know like five or six really well. 
I bet Dan knows a lot more than me. So I'm saying yes, go to Dan for all of your questions <laughs> related to data. Um, so some of the, some of the ones that, that I know best, we just mentioned that one. Uh, Giant, the Giant Consortia uh, is another popular one. Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, which is one I participate in quite a bit. Uh, Charge is, is another one for aging. So there's several of them. Uh, this should look, this is the SSGAC website. This is just the beginning of the list of all of the studies that are on there. Um, 97, I think, is what I saw. Is that like about right? So it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Um, this is the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium. If you were interested in, say, ADHD, there's a whole working group, so you could get tied into that. They're very open to letting you just even less listen in on it, which is very informative if it's something that you're interested in. So, you know, like all, this is the big conclusions. Like all other studies, genetic studies have these issues of representation and measurement. Please do not forget them. It's very tempting to do it. Um, minorities in non-Western countries are generally understudied. Uh, there's movement in improving that, but it's generally not studied right now. Um, and just be very careful by exa examining the documentation to know what you're starting with. Um, your results represent your data, not the truth. Not necessarily the truth. Maybe it does. And let me just end on this one. This is my favorite chart. I always put this up at the end of everything. This is my biomarker hype curve, which is um, borrowed from technology, which is that over time, when a new thing is developed, there's this technology trigger, and it, the peak of expectation, it just rises in expectation. So think about what you care about right now. So GWAS went through this already. Telomeres, epigenetics, microbiome, genetic risk scores, I mean, it can be any kind of version of a technology trigger. Imputation. Each of these things goes through a peak of, this is going to solve all of our problems. And I promise you, you'll sit through conferences. This is what you will hear. Like, this is the new greatest thing. It's going to solve all our problems. And then pretty quickly after, wait, it's not working here. It's not working here. It's not working here. This thing is garbage. <laughs> right? So telomeres right now, by the way, I think are in this trough of disillusionment. They're not. They're the horrible. They're not worth time. Well, they are measuring something. What are they measuring and how can we do it better? And then it comes up to the slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity. So keep this, this model in your mind too. Uh, whatever you hear, it's somewhere along this curve. Um, so maybe try to figure out where it is. And we probably each have slightly different things of where we think these things are. I'd love to see what everyone thinks like genetic risk scores, where they think it is on this versus, say, epigenetics. OK. So with that, uh, let me just say that this is the administration funding for some of the things that we talked about. But that's it for now, and I went over, and I'm sorry about that. All right.